osztály. Befantó de Tötét Midnight Sun Film Festival. Tervetuloa! Tämä festivaali on omistettu edesmenneen taiteellisen johtajamme Peter von Baakin muistolle. And now let me present the uh, film directors and actors and uh, critics, our guests who are already present here at first from England. Mike Lee. Master Niels Malmros. <laughs> Almost by night, uh, uh, by Niels uh, is screened here after this screening, and then he will be in morning discussion tomorrow morning. And then, last but not least, the father of the idea of the festival, Ansi Mantari. Anyway, we will see the great masterpiece of Mike Lee, Vera Drake, tonight, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to have Mike here to introduce the film, because uh, already ten years ago we invited him, at least ten years ago, I remember, maybe even earlier, but uh, he has always had some theater pro uh, projects or, or new films coming and, and it hasn't been possible to get him here, but now finally he is here presenting the films. Please, Mike, some words before the film. Well, it's, um, it's more than a great pleasure to be here at this famous um, Midnight Sun Film Festival. It's the only film festival I've ever been invited to. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I was going to say that. This is the only festival I've ever been invited to which I couldn't imagine what it would be like. <laughs> Every description of this festival leaves you more and more amazed, amused and confused. <laughs> I mean, in my youth, I was used to staying up for 24 hours, but not because it was the, um, the mode, the, the dumb thing, the thing that everybody was doing. Anyway, I have no idea what I'm going to experience in the next few days, but you're going to experience this film bit of dread. Um, we're going to come back at the end. Um, so I won't say uh, anything about the film, except to say that the problem that the film poses, the questions the film poses, are still, uh, 13 years after we made the film, very relevant in many places in the world today. So we'll be here at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
it was worth waiting. <laughs> and uh, at first, an an uh, our announcement, Eskuspaikka vastaavien huomioon, the next screenings that are supposed to start uh, 10 uh, 45 will be 10 minutes late, then so they start 10 55. So, no hurry to the uh, screenings there. Uh, and uh, please, some questions to Mike. I, I can start with the, like you told before the screening that uh, this uh, uh, topic, what's, uh, let's not say the issue, uh, is, um, is still in many countries uh, actual. Uh, how was it in England? This happened in, in the 50s. When, when was the abortion uh, legalized in England? 1967. And where, where there are lots of uh, people like, good people like Vera Great that got this kind of... Well, the truth is... <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that um, the idea of this I sat on for a very long time because I'm old enough to remember what it was like um, long before the 1967 Abortion Act when people had unwanted pregnancies. Um, and so, but the law changed. But um, as we know, it remains contentious in many places, including the United States. But the, the moral questions, the moral debates, are for us all to have. You know? And all I have done in this film is to apply the question of society to deal with this. What's the situation in Finland? That's, that's somebody. 1973. What about. Uh, I'm not as Thornton, who is so fantastic in this role of, of Vera Great. Well, can you tell a little about her and why did you ask her in this role? To well, um, I, I, there's not much to say. I mean, I hadn't previously worked with her, but I knew her work. I just felt um, a very strong instinct that she would do what in fact she did, you know. Um, she's a great character actor. She can do real people. She comes from a working class world. She knows this. She knows these women. She's a great actress. And was the right Questions, please. Mr. Lee, just before this film at the festival, I saw a documentary on Robert Altman. And in, in the documentary, he said that uh, the most important thing, thing in films is the actor. Would you agree? Robert Altmanin dokumentissa, se oli oikeasti hyvä dokumentissa ja sanoi, että kaikkein tärkein asia elokuvassa on näyttelijä. Voitteko se vaan viettä kuulla? No. Um, <laughs> uh, look, uh, here's the thing. I knew uh, Robert Altman quite well, actually. And um, I have enormous respect for him to my great um, uh, delight. He respected my films too. And what we, what in different ways, the films that he made, which were great, and what my films have in common, is the use of actors and improvising and a certain kind of freedom. I arvostan Robert Altman ja tunsin hänet, hänet hyvin ja hän myöskin arvosti tämän ohjaajan elokuvia. Ja se mikä yhdistää heitä on, että kummassakin kupin käyttää ääntelyitä improvisoinnin. But to say that the most important thing in a film as the actors is eccentric, at least. <laughs> I mean, it would be eccentric, but not entirely eccentric. You say the most important thing in the film is the camera. <laughs> so, in a way, I don't need to expand on that. I think you're clear what I'm saying. It's, but that's the great thing about Rob, Bob Altman is that he was. He likes to be controversial and say things that would provoke us. <laughs> and he's succeeded in doing so this evening. <laughs>
Unfortunately, he died before getting here ever. Valitettavasti hän ei koskaan ehtinyt vierailla täällä ennen kuulemansa. Kysymyksiä, questions, please. I sometimes work with the same people, and then I work with new people, it varies, you know. Joskus työtäni samut, työskentäni samut henkilöjen kanssa, mutta sitten taas uusia, että se vaihtelee. But I collaborate with actors to create characters, and we spend a lot of time building up these characters and exploring them and bringing their world, putting them together and bringing their world into existence and exploring it and researching it and improvising their lives and gradually arriving at something which is coherent and meaningful and dramatic and cinematic. But it demands, as I said, referred to earlier, to the question about Imelda Staunton, it demands character actors, people that are creative and can do real people like the people out there in the street, not narcissistic actors. About this story, how long time did you think about it? Because was there some stories in public? Oliko tällaisia tarinoita esillä silloin, kun he suunnitteli tätä elokuvaa? Well, as I said before, I'm old enough to remember what it was like. And there were circumstances that I was around that um, related to these experiences. I remember a woman when I was a kid in the, 19, the early 1950s. I was born in 1943, by the way. Um, and I remember this woman, she was called Nurse Balance. She was a nurse. She had a house. And sometimes young women would go and stay with her and then leave. And then all of a sudden, she wasn't there. She went away for a time. Later, I realized what it was. She'd gone to prison. Sorry. She was a very nice, kind, warm, generous woman. But there were all kinds of experiences. When I started to research it, I unearthed all kinds of cases of you know, that all related. And, um, but just as a matter of, for the record, Vera Drake herself is a fictitious character that we've invented. She's not based on one, one particular case. I read about women who, when they were taken away to go to prison, everybody came out of all the flats and apartments and all shouted and, and made a noise because they were so angry because they were very, these women were important and uh, needed in the community. Unfortunately, our night is very short this first day, so uh, we will continue the discussion outside wherever you meet Mike. You are Hello, everybody. Hello. Sorry. Thank you for waiting, but it clashed with the um, screening of the end of Mr. Turner. Okay. Great. So, welcome everybody to the Q&A session of Mr. Mike Lee. We have effective half an hour in our use. You can have more if you want. I okay. don't. Great, great, great. great. Yeah. We do. Half an hour is a notional thing, <laughs> which I haven't. There are so many of us. Okay. So, if you want to state a question, just please raise your hand, and we will begin right from here. Okay, about Mr. Turner. Uh, not to repeat everything that was said in the morning discussion. A painter friend of mine who had read a book about the critic Ruskin. Uh, she wondered uh, why you depicted Ruskin as a kind of a comical character when usually it's taught that uh, he was an early defender of, uh, of Turner. Uh, is it because you don't really like critics, perhaps? No, it's nothing to do with that. <laughs> In fact, the idea that... Um, it's very interesting, this. I, I, it never occurred to me that anyone would think that... It, uh, it was something to do with my attitude to critics no. until, <laughs> until we took the film to Cannes. And um, Michel Simon, the great, the great French critic, apparently took great offence <laughs> of the film. And I was amazed because it's got nothing to do with that at all. Um, uh, 
Ruskin was a great defender and early. He wrote about Turner um, eloquently and profusely in his first um, book, which was called Modern Painting. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, in the film, he's very enthusiastic about Turner. But uh, um, Ruskin was obviously a very... Um, a kind of prick, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and very much, I mean, we know later he had terrible problems with his uh, marital uh, relationship, um, which is well documented, that's okay. enough for me to spend time talking about mm -hmm. here. Um, we decided, our, our view of Ruskin came from our understanding of him uh, from our research, uh, which is again implicit in the film where you see him with his parents. Mm -hmm. He was raised by these parents in a very uh, cosseted way. Mm -hmm. He was um, an only child. Okay. I mean, he, was, he, had, he, he had no contact with other children at all. He was very, very spoiled. Um, when he went to university, his mother went and took rooms near his rooms. Uh, my theory is so that she could carry on breastfeeding him. <laughs> um, but you know, so, uh, really, the, our dramatization of him in this way is of the young Ruskin. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it, it's it may or may not be legitimate, mm. but it felt legitimate to me within the context yeah. of the film. Good. And you know, it, he is actually funny. And I yeah. think Ruskin. I think Ruskin was was a great and influential and important critic in the nineteenth century. But I wouldn't have him down as one of the funniest people <laughs> that um, <laughs> had anything to do with it. Okay. So, yeah, um, your next film film will be dealing with the Peterloo massacre. So uh, I just wanted to know. Why this topic now? Is there something specific you want to say or contribute to the yes, discussion? Yes, I, I, to be honest, um, I'm really not very inclined to talk about that film because I haven't made it yet. You right. know? And the time to talk about it will be after I've made it. Right. But it is obvious, uh, since you know about it, that, 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 that um, it, apart from the fact that the bicentenary of the event is going to occur in 2019, mm. the truth is it feels very appropriate, opposite to me to be making a film which is about democracy and uh, you know, people's rights, really. Do you feel there is a lack of democracy? Now? Well, uh, yes, but I, I think it's a thing I'd film I'd rather talk about when I've finished. Right. You see, I t the, the truth is I never talk about what I'm going to do at all. Mm. But for this film, for two reasons, we decided to announce it. One is that I wanted to make it clear that I was going to make this film so that nobody else would make it. <laughs> right. <laughs> because mm. the bicentenary is coming. Right. Right. And the other one is that it, it's helped us to raise money by being public about it. Mm. But beyond that, Really, I'd rather talk about the film mm -hmm. when I've finished it. So it means I'll see you back here in about, <laughs> in about five years. Time. Yes. Okay. Right. And now uh, you just mentioned, you know, like raising funds. And I remember, you know, what happened at the BAFTAs when you kind of, you know, let your feelings well known. And I wonder, like, is it is it surprising for you that after all those films and, you know, all your films were very well received, you still find sometimes problems? In no, it's, yeah, it's always a problem mm. because, I mean, people... People are very cautious about what they do with their money, you know, mm -hmm. and you're talking about with even with lower budget films like I make, it, it's still quite a lot of money, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and um, people are concerned as to whether they're going to see their money back and all yeah. that sort of thing. Now, the normal fail safe uh, stratagems are to have a movie star, a fake great star, or a guaranteed something around the other. And people um, confronted with a film where they don't really know what they're going to get because there isn't a script and so on and so forth, are understandably cautious. Therefore, it takes us time to put the money together, really. What I was talking about in my now notorious BAFTA speech was um, the fact that, you know, there need to be people out there who are courageous you know, and trust filmmakers and that filmmakers are given the freedom to make the film and not to, to be dictated to uh, and so on. Um, but that was what I was reflecting on.
Do we have to do that? No, it's very It's like being in the yeah. not Nazi yeah. regime here. <laughs> 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 we sure. can just talk to each other okay. and people can talk yeah. as they want. Yeah. It's very, very, very uh, frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. Salute. Your boy, what is your next question? So you think you will have a competition back in Peter or Massacre? No. You are afraid of it, yes. No, I, I, no, I merely wanted to say that because yeah. it, because the centenary, bicentenary yeah. is coming up, and it, but it's not an issue. But it, it has to have been dealt with in any English uh, fiction or television. One. What? There was a film, there has been some television things related to it. There was a film made in 1948 by the Bolton brothers called Fame is the Spur with Michael Redgrave. And in it, there's a strange sequence, very brief sequence, where this boy imagines the Peterloo Massacre because he's heard his father and grandfather talking about it mm. from their memory. But it's got nothing to do with reality, whatever. It's a kind of mm. fantasy. Really. Oh. But I don't want to talk any more about that film, okay. if you don't mind, because no. I'd rather wait till I've made the film. If I, I do. Wait, the film, and then we talk about it. I know so much is being said about the way you work, you know, like... Don't worry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not from Finlay, I don't mind. <laughs> they can't do anything. Uh, no, I just, you know, uh, but what I find curious is that uh, you always talk about how important it is for you to actually work on one-on-one. -on -one I, say it, I say it more slowly, I can't. Uh, yeah, so about the way you work, oh, I, yeah. I'm curious, why is it so important for you to work one-on-one -on -one with the actor? I mean, because... Well, because, it, why is it important for you to work individually with each actor? Mm -hmm. Um, because what we are doing when we make these, bring these, uh, invent these worlds and bring them into existence, mm -hmm. um, it all is revolves around being able to uh, reach uh, a, a situation where the actors can be in character with each other, behaving in a completely real way mm -hmm. uh, and being like real people in a three-dimensional way um, uh, and in all kinds of ways it's about if you like simulating real life mm -hmm. so what we're doing it, what you need to do in order to do that mm -hmm. is to make people like real people now we all all of us, like everybody in this room, you know, we are all separate individuals that come from that background and we are all, you know, uh, specific uh, uh, and idiosyncratic in various ways. By working individually with each actor to create the beginnings of a character, mm. to start to make them, it means that when you get to put them together, they know who they are, mm -hmm. and they're absolutely, they, they, when people take part in my films, they only ever know about what's going on from the point of view of their character. They never know about the, they never have an overview of the mm -hmm. whole thing. They, they really, you, you can put them in situations and have them improvise in an organic way, a truthful way, mm -hmm. um, based on them being really rooted in who they are. Mm -hmm. Now, you couldn't, and therefore, like, what I don't know you and you know, don't really know me, mm -hmm. and therefore that dynamic is built into this conversation. I mean, if we knew each other very well, this, we would have a different kind of conversation. Um, and so when you put two people together who are played by actors, you have to, they have to know no more or less mm -hmm. than they really would. So it's important that, uh, that I start individually with each actor to create the character so that when we put them together, they are just... Uh, we can explore how they interact and if they were going to build a long relationship over years then that's what we do and it takes weeks and months to do so. Mm. But you couldn't begin to make it all happen in the real and responsible way that we do unless, if, if they we're in a committee or inventing each other, you know, it would be stupid. Mm -hmm. So it has to be individual. And also, there are other aspects of it too. I mean, we don't only talk about the characters, we actually do practical work, mm -hmm. so they start to be the characters. Now, they do that in a situation where there's nobody else there. And I even leave them by themselves, so they can really 
get into the habit of not worrying about the effect, but really can do it from the inside and be truthful. Mm. And that again is part of this, that, that, that is made possible by working individually with them. Does that well answer your question? Yeah, but weren't you ever afraid that then you're going to end up with two actors kind of playing in a different movie at the beginning at least? You did, you know, no, one that doesn't happen. That. Uh, and that's part of my responsibility to make sure it, doesn't, mm. it just, just doesn't happen. Yeah. Not. In fact, the truth is that problem has never occurred to me till you mention it now, mm -hmm. and I've been doing this since 1965. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you... you you, in the 1990s, you, you made uh, Topsy Turvy, and your most recent film, Mr. Turner, yeah. deals with the 19th century England, yeah. like Topsy Turvy, and your next film, which we are not going to talk about, yeah. is, is also dealing with the 19th century yeah. England. So what is it in 19th century England or I, Britain that interests you? I don't know particularly. I think, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. But I, I would say this, that, 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 um, that certainly f for me and I think people of my age, the 19th, growing up, the 19th century hung in the recent air. I mean, I um, was born in the 40s and so my grandparents would have been born around about 1880 or something. Uh, I went to a school schools that were built, that were Victorian schools. We were taught by people that were born in the late Victorian era, that Victorian culture hung in the air. The, the buildings around the city I grew up in in Manchester were uh, Victorian, you know. I think the 19th century uh, hung, in the hung, hung in the recent air. People have said to me about Mr. Turner, um, well, you know, the language was very period, and how did you manage to get into the spirit, the zeitgeist of that period. Well, I reflect on the interesting fact that although it's a remote time, it seems, actually, J.M.W. Turner died only 92 years before I was born, <laughs> which is the equivalent of 1923. You know, that's not long ago. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, I think... Um, I can't really answer your question by saying I'm passionate about the 19th century or it, it, it strikes deep at my sense of poetry or time or history or anything else, but the 19th century is the beginning of a world which hangs in our collective memory. I mean, if I was to make a film, which I am not going to, in the set in the 12th century or even the 14th century, I would have a great deal of difficulty in bringing it to life in the same way. But the 19th century, you know, I mean, people were living and talking in, in, a, in a way that relates. To, it's, the, it's part of, it's the early part of this modern world that we live in, in a sense, you know. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting that I should now, for me, it's interesting that y you are legitimately able to ask me that question, because, of course, my uh, um, main uh, project for decades has been to make films about contemporary life, you know, mm -hmm. about the 20th and then the 21st century. So suddenly to find myself being the 19th century man mm -hmm. is curious, um, but that's the way it is. It just, I, I, it's one of those things. Right? Is there something we should learn from the 19th century? Well, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, there's plenty of things about the 19th century which we can be duly horrified about, but that's true of the 21st century as well. Um, no, I, I, I would hope that, I don't know, I've, every film, film we make, we learn things from doing it. You know. mm. I don't really know the answer to that. In fact, that's a question with no answer. So we had a chance to talk yesterday, and you said that uh, all your films are political. Could you just open that a little bit more. Yes, I mean, I, well, we, uh, with, all, with respect, that was within a long conversation we yeah. had last night, yeah, yeah. Um, of course. Um, well, I mean, you know, uh, we're talking about society, you know, and the way we live our lives and the way we, uh, you know, cope with each other and deal with each other and deal with the problems of life. And, you know, uh, everything we do is defined by social, economic, cultural, uh, 
notions and parameters and so on and so forth. And in that sense, uh, you know, I don't think my films are looking at people in a kind of idealized vacuum of any kind, you know, and therefore they are by implication and definition. Do you find that there's a chance to change the world with art and films? Well, I, I mean, for example, as I uh, said when they screened here, Secrets and Lies yesterday, um, you know, uh, we made that film about the predicament of somebody that's been given away for adoption as a child and then seeks her birth mother. And I said that, which is the case, that it's illegal, remains illegal 20 years after we made the film, in fact, uh, to do so, to trace your birth parent, because the law in many places is uh, designed to protect the mother rather than the, the rights, the human rights of the child. Uh, over the years after we made the film, I got letters from all around the world from people saying, your film changed my life, your film, you know, I, I, I'm adopted, I was given away, I've decided to find my birth mother, it succeeded, it didn't succeed, uh, or I, people, letters that said I gave my child away and now I, you know, want the child to get in touch and I hope it happens. And so, so, so that's an example of a feeling that I was able, was, had the privilege of having, which is that we made a film that in some ways affected apparently quite a lot of people's lives. But even if it's not as specific as that, you know, even if it's just, you know, whether it's stuff dealing with the way you treat other people or relationships or whatever it is, you know, every little thing is, so I think, I hope that, yeah, art should in some way uh, affect lives, however, in however sm great or small, to whatever great or small a degree. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Mm -hmm. More precise, you, you feel yourself that uh, as a filmmaker has a role to play, or well, I think artists do have a role to play. If you're concerned with, I've concerned with them. Um, in a, what I would regard as a decadent way, with art being uh, an esoteric thing for a, um, just for <coughs> connoisseur of some kind, then that's fine. But I feel that art, certainly the kind of uh, art that for the most part cinema can be, has a, a role to play in informing people's lives in some way, you know, but it doesn't, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm as much in the business of making people laugh mm -hmm. as cry, you know, mm -hmm. and those two things are important and in some ways inseparable. Um, and that itself, I think, is uh, some kind of responsibility for, you know. If you're gonna, look, if you're going to make stuff and put it out there, you have to take some responsibility for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what's the point of doing it? Uh, if you do something and you put it out there, as you as you said, are you sometimes surprised about reactions? I, yeah. I was even thinking about Happy Go Lucky, you know, how the main character kind of divided the audience completely. Some just wanted to strangle her after the screening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean uh, that I regard as a, that's a that's a slightly different matter because mm. I cannot mm. understand anybody, anybody that was awake throughout the film, <laughs> not getting by the end of the film that she wasn't just a stupid, that she was a very centred, mm. responsible, sensible woman with a great sense of humour, you know, and if you don't get that, if you, if you are, uh, if you stay as the, such people that criticised it obviously were, stay locked into your first impression of her mm. and you don't go with the film and as it opens her up and you discover what she really is about, mm. then you are, simply haven't fulfilled your responsibility as an audience member. Mm. Um, and since most of the people that came out with those kind of um, responses were actually professional critics and not real people, um, <laughs> that's, that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> so, I mean, the point is, uh, the question you're asking, 
with reference to that film doesn't quite come under the category of learning something new from mm. people's diverse reactions. Of course, you do do that, mm. but that's just learning that people, some people are just plain stupid, basically. They're not paying mm. attention. You know? mm. Okay, if I may ask about your working method, this question. In the morning we uh, learned that you used to paint and draw. Do you ever make storyboards or pictures for your uh, uh, cinematographer or to, to, to explain what I, you are thinking about no. in the scene? Okay. No, no uh, not really. I mean, very occasionally in conversation with... But no, okay. it's not part of the process. No, okay. Uh, well... Uh, uh, well, I, I read that y you uh, you want to have a improvisation during the shootings, uh, but, but that partly uh, the, the actors are improvising when you, when when you're shooting the film. Is that correct? Well, uh, all of my films come out of. I talked earlier in this conversation about getting actors to improvise. Mm. Everything in all of my films come out of improvisation. Right. Everything right. in all the films. And everything you see on the screen, with a tiny slither of exceptions, is not improvised on the camera. It's been rehearsed and rehearsed, and then it's shot. But it comes out of improvisation in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you whether that squares with your question, I don't know. Yeah, so you are, in, in a sense, you are complete opposite to, to Aki Kaurismaki, who wants his actors to stick to the script exactly. No, mm. on the contrary. Uh, I want them to stick to the script exactly because mm. we've moved from improvisation into something that's very, very precise. Yeah, Kaurismaki is there's no real soul and it's one shot and that's it. That was the difference, I think. I, 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 I can't communicate to you enough but what is on the screen were you in the session this morning yeah i was actually <laughs> well I, I this was very clearly explained when they showed the scene from both the scene from naked and the scene from happy go lucky i explained very very clearly okay. that that was arrived at. i mean if you were listening to what i said you heard me say it <laughs> but we rehearsed it rehearsed obviously it, i wasn't we rehearsed yeah. it rehearsed it and rehearsed it until right. it was very precise i said it about 12 times and they showed those two clips and it's very very clear uh, but both the stuff came out of improvisation in the first place right but then you see i would ask you to reflect on this all art is a synthesis of improvisation and order. Mm. You as a writer, you're going to go and write this thing. You know, you'll write it down first draft, improvising, then you go back and rework it, and then you rework it, and then it's precise. That's what painters do, and novelists do, and poets and musicians, and that's what how mm. we make art. I do it involving the actors, um, and starting with your question about separately and all the rest mm. of it. You know, we by a very elaborate and slow process, we build up the whole. We arrive at a point where we arrive at the, the actual uh, premise of the action itself in the film. And we, they, having been improvising for ages, they then improvise. And then we stop and we pin it down and we make it precise and precise and precise and we work it and work it until it's really ready to shoot and then we shoot it. But that was all explained this morning. <laughs> Is it any way uh, different when you are making historical films? Do you have to stick no. more to the facts? before you start no, to improvise. No, 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 that's, you're conflating two different issues. Okay. Um, no, the facts are, you see, even if you're improvising and it's a contemporary subject in a world that we've invented, we've still invented facts about mm -hmm. these people. We still Art, created yeah. a world, you know, we've yeah. made decisions about this is what his name is and that's where she lives and yeah. that's and this is February and that was last December and whatever yeah. it is. Yes. And they've just had lunch or whatever. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that instead we're saying, okay, well it's actually 1825 mm -hmm. and this is the year before he did that. But, but we are talking about bringing to life these bringing in life. the moment. Good. I mean, you can, with regards to these two period films that I you know, you can improvise, you can research these people, these characters, this wor these worlds for a thousand years. Mm. But it doesn't make it happen in front of the camera. Mm. You know, s what happens in front of the camera is an organic living thing yeah. in the moment. Mm. You know, so that's really the key to it. I'm interested in the very beginning of 
your work process like what do you have like a theme or idea or character or what do you start with or is, is there a better it varies it varies from project to project sometimes okay in the case say of uh, uh, secrets and lies or vera drake mm -hmm. the the main premise the main idea to explore in these two films I s sat with me for years, Secrets and Lies, because people close to me in my life had adopted children. Vera Drake, because I'm sadly old enough to remember what it was like before the Abortion Act uh, in the 1960s. I can remember what it was like when people had unwanted pregnancies and there were these women around, these people that performed these illegal abortions. So that idea to explore sat with me for probably uh, 40 years. Um, so in setting out to make both of those films, I had these particular ideas on the go. But there are films I've made like Naked or Happy Go Lucky, for example, where I had a very fluid notion of what it would be, something vague about men and women's unacceptable male behaviour and something to do with the millennium and things were floating around in naked. I mean, secret, uh, 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 um, happy-go-lucky. I, you know, just had this idea. I worked with Sally Hawkins on a, a couple of previous films and I got to know her very well. And I just had this idea that I we could make a film that in some way would tap into this energy. <laughs> <laughs> and, th you know, so I started to work with her and this character started to emerge and then it just grew out of that, really. And, uh, and um, you know, ideas, if you make films as I do, which in the end are not, uh, are not the working out of rigid intellectual slogans but there are but are multifaceted and there are all sorts of things that are going to go on then you know you, you know in the end of course what emerges is that actually if you compare um, naked with happy go lucky they you suddenly discover that quite by accident they have quite a lot of things in common each has a central protagonist which is unusual for my films in quite the same way. Each has a very singular central protagonist. Um, the interesting thing is that th they're both idealists. They're both energetic idealists. The difference is that Johnny in Naked is a frustrated idealist who, who, whose frustration in the end um, folds in on, it, on itself. Poppy in Happy Go Lucky is a positive idealist who puts her money where her mouth is and <laughs> does things. Um, both films turn out to, in some way, implicitly, to be about education. Poppy's a good teacher. The driving instructor is a bad teacher. The the um, uh, teacher of flamenco is a good teacher, but she doesn't know how to leave her emotional crap outside the, <laughs> outside the room, you know, and so on. Mm -hmm. Actually, Naked, at some implicit level, is about education in the sense that here is a guy who plainly is really, really bright. And you just know that he went to school and they took, didn't take him seriously. They didn't, instead of they just repressed him and, and uh, didn't bring him out. Because any decent teacher, thank you, any half-decent teacher would have made sure he wound up going to university, you know. So, so I don't know. I, I you know, I'm, you know, I'm in the business of um, discovering what a film is. This is answering your question. Discovering what a film is by going on the journey of making the film and discovering what it is by doing it. Really. And why is it always so important for you to stress that you're not a naturalist? That you know, you're interested in ordinary life, but you also, I know, passionate about theatre. So you want to kind of incorporate that as well. So what was the first part of your question about naturalism, did you say? Then why you always stress that you're not, you know... Well, I mean, you know, in the end, you, you know, people can put whatever labels they want. Mm. Because what I do is what it is. Yeah. That's the end of it. I, I think, according to some 
received definitions of naturalism and realism, mm. but my stuff is not naturalistic in the sense that I'm not in the business of recording the surface detail of stuff mm. and leaving it just at that. Uh, you know, you want to get underneath it and to distill the essence of things in some way. But um, but then you said something about theatre, and what was that? Yeah, because, you know, uh, you always said that, you know, you're not just inspired with movies, but theatre and vaudeville, you know, circus even, and you try to kind of take some parts of it into the Well, I, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, it, all these things just feed into, fed into my awareness of things, and, mm. you know, they're just there, really. And I do make theatre, but, um, you know, uh, yes, I don't know what else to mm. Do you mind? Uh, I have a question, or I'm not sure if there was a question before, but would you be willing to talk about gender in your films? You know, talk about anything you want. Because <coughs> I, I find it. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you I, join I, us at the table? Yeah, okay, well, the lights are disturbing me, but yeah, I'll do that. Um, I find it exceptional the way that uh, women are sort of pictured in your films, and I'm not sure how to ask if that is. Of course, it's intentional. So, but I find it different from many other films that are made nowadays or later in the years. Or made by men. Well. Well. Uh, uh, um, I, I've never really um, made a sort of conscious ideological decision to make films that centre on women as such. If I have any idea, if in a secondary uh, department of considerations, if I've got any ideology about any aspect of this, it is that I have a commitment to making good parts for women because there aren't many in movies. Um, but more uh, central than that, as a, that's important, but then as a secondary consideration. It, it just, you know, uh, because for the most part, the worlds that I look at are the worlds which are about men and women. Unfortunately, they have to pick up some things from there since that is the only way there, so. There's no, nothing to stop them, <laughs> <laughs> not even us. <laughs> Um, Sorry for this, but it's all right. Don't worry. We'll just carry on as though you weren't there. Um, <laughs> it, it, it just comes naturally that you know we are looking at worlds where it, it are worlds of women and men, and uh, it, it just seems natural to. And sometimes it just seems the most natural thing to focus on on the women, you know, uh, 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 and. Uh, Sort of that's all there is to it, really, mm. because that's what we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with the world. We're dealing with the, the we're dealing with the battle of the sexes. We're dealing with, with you know, uh, men and women and parenting and uh, you know relationships and the sex that underpins you know the, uh, the, the role of women and the role of men and all the rest of it. I, that's all I can say about it. Really. Does it have to do with how you look at like people as individuals and not like masses, like you refer to the? Uh, well, I guess so. Yeah, of course. But that's just those are two separate things. But yeah, I'm right. sure they relate, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I I always feel, to be honest, whenever I get asked this sort of question about women in my films.